Nick. I'm one of the pastors here at Holland Chapel, and I love to get up here and look out and see who all I was singing with. So thank you so much for being here today. It's going to be a great day at Holland Chapel. We are wrapping up a four-part series discussing two of the things that we spend most of our time with, work and family. And you can go back the previous three weeks and uh, listen online on Holland Chapel's website, or you can even watch the worship gatherings on Facebook if you want to catch up. We've talked the last three weeks, uh, week one, we talked about that work matters to God, that it has a purpose. Uh, Week two, we talked about that work is an opportunity. It's a platform for us to honor God through. And actually, yesterday, I was speaking with a gentleman at a baseball game, and uh, he happens to work for the schools, and uh, he said... Uh, he gave me an instance of a miracle that God worked and, and just a, a way that God used his job as a platform to honor and to glorify God. Last week, Pastor Roger reminded us that believers are in the family of God. And as a result, we've been given the Holy Spirit. And one of the Holy Spirit's purposes is to produce fruit in our lives. Not apples, not oranges, but fruit that's evidence of a life that's following Jesus. We use this passage from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And our challenge is, as believers is to display that fruit in its true biblical form, not fake fruit that we talked a little bit about last week, but the true biblical form of those fruits to those around us, which most of the time is the people we work with and our family. And so that's why we're in a series entitled Work and Family. Those two things actually have more in common than just being the people that we spend most of our time with, though. I did a little experiment uh, this past week, went around the office and asked uh, some of the pastors to share adjectives, to give me words that people use to describe work as it is hard. So what would you use to describe work being hard? And some of the words that they came up with was or were exhausting, disappointing, never-ending, monotonous, difficult, draining, frustrating. Maybe you can relate to some of those words in your workplace as the, in, in the fact that work is hard. You've probably came home from work before and said some of those words to a family member and said, it was exhausting today, it was draining Even though work was originally meant for good, it can be all of those things. It can be all those things. It's hard sometimes. And family is also by design good. God intends family to be a very good thing. And throughout the Bible, family is used as a positive analogy. In fact, we already mentioned this morning that believers are part of the family of God. But like work, family can be hard. Family can be hard. It can also use those same words, exhausting, disappointing. seems to be never-ending, monotonous, difficult, draining, frustrating. All those words can also be used from time to time to describe interaction with family. It's hard. Think about it. It, it, It's exhausting. Sometimes you fall into bed after all the week's activities or all the day's activities, and you just fall into bed. It's exhausting. Maybe you're waiting on your teenager to come home from prom like I was last night. Exhausting. He's on time, though. He came home on time. Frustrating. Family can be frustrating, speaking of teenagers. Never ending. It can seem like the work is never done. I've heard story after story after story of a grandparent who had reached retirement age And now they're caring for their parents. Or just last week I heard about a grandparent that reached retirement age and now the need arises for her to raise her three grandchildren. It can be never ending. Family family can be hard. It can seem monotonous. Anybody else changed a thousand diapers before over and over and over? Monotonous, the same things over and over again. This picture says it all really. Mama ain't easy. That's my brother Todd. I don't know. I don't know where he got the shirt. I don't want to know. But moms can relate. Mama ain't easy. Family is hard. 
That's why the fruit of the Spirit is so important. That's why we need the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit is helping us turn our focus from all about me to everyone else. Because when it's all about me, it seems monotonous. When it's all about me, it seems frustrating. When it's all about me, it's difficult, it's draining. But Jesus said our focus should be on everybody else. It should be on others first. In fact, John 13, 34. He said, love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. This is right after Jesus demonstrated his love, the true love, sacrificial love, putting other people first. Jesus says this, love as I have loved you. Put other people first. I know this next picture is going to be really hard for me because it's a picture of a different college than the University of Arkansas. See, I'm a Razorback fan. I, I love the Razorbacks. I'm rooting for the Razorbacks even if they're in playing badminton. And by the way, if you turn on talk radio, they should be ranked number one in badminton. Like, I, I, I would root for the Razorbacks in anything. But this picture is a picture of the Baylor Bears. We've got some church members that love the Baylor Bears. They went 28-2 and two this year. They won the national championship in basketball. Their team motto, the Baylor Bears team motto this year was joy. And it stands for Jesus, others, than yourself. Isn't that not cool? They put other people first. Their teammates became first. Their fans became first. Their coach became first. It was never all about me when it came to the Baylor Bears this year. Joy, Jesus, others, and yourself. Jesus put it this way also in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, love your neighbor as yourself, and then he immediately followed it up with a parable that I'd invite you to turn your Bible to, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we're going to look at this parable real quick. We're not going to go into all the incredible details of this story, but I do want us to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. <clears throat> Jesus explaining our need to put others first, to love our neighbor as ourself. He tells this story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead be beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by him. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. <clears throat> Now, again, not going into all the details of who the Samaritan was or why this story was an incredible example of loving your neighbor as yourself, I want you to notice what the Samaritan, what the Samaritan could have used as excuses along the way here. This encounter would have been frustrating for him. He, no doubt, had places to be. He could have been frustrated. This encounter was costly. He paid for the supplies. He even paid for the future care for this man. This encounter would have been difficult for him. It says he put the man on his own donkey, and so the Samaritan walked along the road as the wounded man rode on his donkey. This encounter would have been draining, never-ending. He even says he would take care of him uh, later on down the road if needed. It also says that he took care of him that night at the inn. It says he put him on his own donkey. When he got to the inn, he took care of him. This would have been draining. It would have been frustrating. It would have been costly. All of those adjectives that we'd use to describe work and family sometimes. But how did the Samaritan go all, through all of that and still say in the end, I'll pay even more the next time I'm here if needed? It's because he wasn't thinking about himself. He wasn't thinking about the cost or the frustration or what he had to do or how tired he was. He was putting others first. Now, at about this point in the sermon, no doubt you're saying, Nick, okay, 
but we're in work and family. What in the world does that have to do with the Samaritan? Why are we telling this story? Here's why I think this story is important. It's for the same reason that this passage or this, this topic this morning was difficult for me. Because sometimes I'm more likely to think of others outside the home than I am inside the home. And I'll admit that. I, I dreaded uh, this topic because I knew that in our second worship gathering there was going to be a family sitting right down there that could think about all the times I didn't do what I'm saying the Bible tells us we should do this morning. Sometimes I'm more likely to look like the Samaritan away from my family. How about you guys? Work and family, they're both hard. But think about this. Sometimes we respond to those hardships differently depending on where we're at. When work gets difficult, we fight through it. When it gets exhausting, we keep showing up. When it's disappointing, we try harder. When it's frustrating, we just grin and bear it, get the job done. We harvest fruit in those moments. We, we let the fruit of the Spirit show in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. The fruits of the Spirit show up when we're at work. But when family gets hard, when my plans have been changed, when I need a break, when I'm not happy, when my expectations aren't met, we might give a cold shoulder. We might say, not right now to our kids. We might raise our voices. We might lose our patience. We might even shirk the responsibility that we have as a husband or as a father. Why? Why do we react differently? Why do we react differently at home than we do when we're at work. Here's what I think. I think that somehow when we get off work and we're not in public anymore, then we think that we can change this order that God designed. We think that now it's time to put myself first. I've worked hard all day. Now it's about me. Now let me kick my feet up. Let me relax. Let me get the one that gets the attention. It's my turn. And if Jesus was from the South, he would say this. I've always wanted to use this in a sermon. If Jesus was from the South, he would say hogwash. Because it's not true. But is that not what we do? We think, okay, I did my, I showed the fruits of the Spirit. I put others first. But now I can, it's my turn. And guess what? There's still people all around you that we're supposed to put first. That we're supposed to think of before ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit is produced to help us follow Jesus' example of others first. The Bible says, by our fruit, by our love, the world will know that we're his followers. Philippians 1.11. This is not something that we can turn off and then turn back on. We don't get that privilege. Jesus says, put others first. Love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say when you're there or when you're there. It's not something you get to flip a switch. Philippians 1.11 says, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. See, like work, family is also a platform that can be used to bring God honor and glory. And we're going to talk about in a minute how it can do the exact opposite. We've got to fight hard to cultivate that fruit in our lives. To fight that me first attitude, especially when we're in our home. When I'm thinking about myself, those hard truths of family, those things that make family hard, those hard truths, they can lead to hurt, anger, laziness. And the perfectly designed family because, becomes something that's really, really ugly. And as a result of that, God is far from, from glorified. <clears throat> the family, those people close to you, they won't want to know anything about this book. They won't want to know anything about these truths that lead you to be one way over there and another way over here. I've heard from adults, again, just this last week, I heard from adults that don't want anything to do with faith because of the fake fruit that they saw growing up. I don't want to see it. They do not care because it did not change. It was a show. And that's what I think sometimes we put on. 
is a show when we flip that switch. It's imperative that we model the same fruit inside the home as outside. And Josh put it this way. We went through these uh, words to describe family and work, and I, I said, you know what? Those same words can be used to describe family. And Josh said, Josh Turner said, we need to put some work in at home. So that's what we're going to talk about just for a few minutes this morning, putting some work in at home. We've got to harvest that fruit in all seasons, in all stages of life. Some of us are at the latter stage in life, and guess what? Family's still hard. Some of us are in the early stages of life, and family is hard. Little toddlers running around. Some of you teenagers in the room aren't married yet, and guess what? Family is hard. You're having to deal with consequences, and being grounded and disciplined in family is hard. The Bible says the fruit, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I got some advice on this topic from a local pastor. Contrary to much belief, a church is not a competition. We love the pastors in our area. And uh, we communicate regularly with several pastors in Saline County. And I was sitting down with lunch with... Uh, Pastor Michael Reese this week and talking to him about family and raising kids and he gave me a couple of uh, tidbits of advice that I want to expound upon this morning with you. So these are going to be our points. This is what I want to challenge you to do, church, as you live out and you display the fruit of the Spirit in your families. Number one is be consistent. Be consistent. Show the same patience to your spouse that you show to your coworkers. Display the same self-control with your tongue at home that you have with your boss. Be present with your children as faithfully as you are showing up at work. Don't give away all your joy before you get home. Be consistent. Display the fruits at work and in your family. This next picture is is Drew Brees. He's a quarterback in the NFL. He holds countless records. He's no doubt a Hall of Famer. Uh, he became really on the scene when he, he's quarterback of the Saints and he led them to a Super Bowl the year after Hurricane Katrina. And so he's the, the hero of New Orleans. I happened to be listening to an interview that he did after a heartbreaking game and just shared, bookmark, whatever you do on an on a internet when you say, I want to hear that again sometime and go back and find it later. And I did that this week, January of 2019. They were one game from the Super Bowl. One game from the Super Bowl. His career is nearing an end. And something happened that commentators describe as one of the greatest injustices in NFL history. Like, it was outrageous. You could not deny they were robbed. It was a blown call. It led to instant replay in the NFL, major changes to the game of football. And it was especially devastating to Drew Brees, knowing that this may have been his last chance to get that Super Bowl. Immediately after the game, and the game's over, heartbreaking, one of the most heartbreaking losses. He could say he got robbed. It was just devastating. And here's what Drew Brees said. The first thing I did after the game was go get my kids, who were in the bleachers, bring them down out onto the field and play with them, because that's what we do after every game. So why should this be any different? It's the thrill of their week to get to do that. He was thinking about others. See, he could have said, I'm so mad. He could have stormed off to the locker room. He could have uh, forgotten about who was there to watch him. But in that moment, a true character-defining moment, he said, I'm going to do what we always do because this moment is important to my kids. And he went down on the field and he said, I played dad. I threw passes. I held the ball while they kicked it, and we ran around the field. And that's two of his four children there in the picture. Be consistent at work, in the family, wherever you're at. Be consistent modeling the fruits of the Spirit. Number two is admit our failures. Because guess what? They're coming. We all are going to slip up. We probably can think of times, even maybe in the last few days, where our tongue slipped up, where we... Maybe you told our kids, not right now. I need a break. And we said, give me that remote. It's my turn. Admit your failures. And students here, the Holy Spirit's working on you too. Being a teenager doesn't give you an excuse. 
The Bible doesn't say the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in adults. Believers in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's producing this kind of fruit in you. And when your world is revolving around you, when you shut down and won't communicate, when you isolate yourself, shutting your door, when you're hateful to those around you, when you're no fun to be around, when things don't go your way, wait a minute. I didn't just describe teenagers, did I? Man, I described some husbands and some wives and some teenagers and some senior adults. Admit, hey, I got it out of order. I'm being selfish here. Admit it. Admit your failures. We've all been there. Paul says there's a war going on between the sinful nature and the spirit. And no one is exempt from that battle. And sometimes we lose. Sometimes we lose. And it's time that we start admitting it. Because you know what? If you want those around you to think this faith really matters, if you want those that are watching you every day to think this means something, admit it when you slip up. Tell them that's not the way I'm supposed to be acting, and I'm sorry. Ruth Graham, I wanted to squeeze this quote in because I love this quote. I told this quote to Darren and Melanie. I saw them out there. They just got married, and we were doing some premarital uh, counseling. Ruth Graham says, a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Now, how do you think Ruth Graham knew that the happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers? Because even Billy Graham slipped up. He probably admitted his failures. And she knew that the union is of good, two good forgivers. If you want your families to know that your faith means something, admit it when you mess up. Number three, stay connected. Probably the most important one, no doubt. Stay connected. John 15, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, He is the vine and we are the branches. We can't do it. It's not something we can will ourselves to do. We've got to stay connected. Jesus said he's the vine, we're the branches, and disconnected we can bear no fruit. See, a branch draws strength. It draws nourishment. It draws protection and energy from the vine. And when we ignore the word of God, when we neglect our prayer life, when we isolate, our, isolate our things, our, ourselves from the things of God, we're like a broken off, snapped off branch. We're not drawing any nourishment. We're not drawing any energy. We're not drawing any strength because we're disconnected. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10 says, Then the way you live will always honor God and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you'll grow as you learn to know God better and better. Staying connected, learning to know God better and better. That's when your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. When you're connected. When you're spending time with the Lord. When you're strengthening your relationship. When you're in the word. When you're hanging around other believers. That's when that production is going to start to happen. You see, fruit produced is only as good as the labor you put into it. You can't just scatter seeds out there in the field. If so, I'd have a much easier afternoon ahead of me. You got to put the work in. It takes work. It takes time to produce a good crop. Recognize the Holy Spirit's work in your lives as you stay connected to the vine. A few years ago, I went to a uh, Sunday school party, and uh, this particular Sunday school class always uh, had gag gifts. You might call it Dirty Santa, you might call it White Elephant, whatever you call it. And someone opened up this giant box, and it looked like it was going to be a good one. And uh, you open up this box, and inside are all these uh, things wrapped up. It looked like, you know, something important. And you unwrap all of them, and it was this big old set of ugly glass fruit. And so what I did with them throughout the rest of the party is I wandered around the house and hid all these little pieces of fruit all over the house, in the bathroom, in the living room behind the fireplace and I thought I was pretty clever well then uh, about a few months later I started to find them around the office they would start popping up in the office and I hid some this morning here's one over here uh, behind Miss Lisa uh, I see 
one over here under the front row. They started popping up in the office, uh, and we would find one on a bookshelf. We would find one in the office kitchen back there. Uh, there's one there in front of you, Brad, on the second row. Uh, here's one up here, Mr. Chuck, by the drum set. And these fruits started popping up all over the place. Does that happen in your home? The fruit of the Spirit should not be a surprise when it's found around the house. The fruit of the Spirit should not be a surprise. You shouldn't just say, oh, look at there, there's a little bit of love. Oh, there's some kindness over there. It's got to be consistent. Here's our challenge, church. We've got to quit playing hide and seek with the fruits of the Spirit. We've stopped at the list of the fruit, but I want to read the next couple of verses. Past Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. That's getting rid of the me first. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Follow the Spirit's leading. The verb there is translated like walk in line behind a leader. You remember those school days when you'd fight to be the line leader? I'm coaching a fourth grade girls basketball team and every time I say I need two lines there or I need a line there, every girl goes to the front of the line. They try to fight until they get in the front of the line. It's our nature. We want to be first. The Bible says follow the Spirit's leading, walk in line behind a leader. And when you have a leader, and we do, and his name is Jesus, guess what? You're not first. You're not first. It says follow that leader in every part of our lives. If you don't have that leader this morning, let me tell you that Jesus Christ earned the right to be your leader. When he came to this earth, lived sinlessly, died on the cross, rose again three days later for your sin, for my sin, so that we can have a relationship with God who created us. Let Jesus be your leader this morning. If you don't have that leader, you're like a branch cut off from the vine. And guess what? That vine gives life. It gives hope. It gives peace. That's what Jesus Christ can do for you today. I pray you would make that decision this morning. There are three ways that we want to invite you to respond this morning as we get ready to sing this next song. During the song, after the song, before the song, move. We've got a connect corner back here. There's going to be some friends back there that would love to tell you how Jesus Christ can change your life. They would love to answer any questions that you have about Holland Chapel or your next steps, whether it be baptism, whether it be church membership. If you just need someone to pray with you, that you would stay consistent. Respond in person today. You can also respond by dropping in those connect cards. Let us know how we can hold you accountable. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know how we can help you on your journey to look more and more like Jesus. And then church, take action this morning. Be consistent. Admit your failures. Maybe you need to go home today and at lunch just say, I've not been displaying the fruit that the Holy Spirit's producing in me. Maybe you need to commit this morning to stay connected to the vine. Whatever it is, respond this morning. Would you stand as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. For all that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving us here to battle these hard phases of life, these hard stages that life takes us through with no help, but that you give us the fruit of the Spirit so that we can reflect your love to the world, so that we can be reminded to put others first the same way that you did when you thought of us as you carried that cross. Lord, I pray for anyone that doesn't know you this morning that they would make that decision even before they leave this building. Lord, for everyone else, I pray that we would take your message to heart and realize that we just can't flip a switch and turn it off and turn it on, but we're to display the Holy Spirit's work in our lives no matter what we're doing. In every part of our lives, let us follow your 
leadership. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. so good to be here with you guys this morning and church uh, as Nick said we need to put work in at home so important so valuable and how we can apply the fruits of the spirit to our lives uh, a few quick announcements before we let you guys go this morning Nick uh, invited you and shared with you a few ways to respond we hope that you guys will do those things um, we're excited to begin next Sunday a new message series uh, titled lessons from the wilderness uh, that will begin next Sunday excited to begin this new series with you guys at 9 a.m and 10 45 a.m also um, students parents of students uh, mission trip deadline is going to be may 9th we invite you to sign up as soon as you're able to at hollandchapel.org uh, be uh, uh, please take note of the dates uh, uh, for those also membership class if you're ready uh, to take that next step and being all in here at hc we'd love to talk to you about membership explain to you what that looks like and help you um, take that next step in, in, in 
uh, membership here at HC. That class will be Sunday, May 16th at 9 a.m. Uh, just sign up using your Connect card, whether it be online or here in person this morning to sign up for that. Um, and so i also invite, invite you guys, be sure to turn in your Connect cards. If you're a first-time guest, turn your Connect card into the back table. We'd love to give a gift with you guys. Also on your way out, you'll see that there are some yard signs. We'd love for you as spring cleaning takes place, as the weather turns warmer, to feel free to pick up a yard sign, put it out in your yard to let people know they are invited. They are welcome to worship with us this morning. May we be consistent. May we admit our failures and may we stay connected. Finding a fruit of the Spirit shouldn't be a surprise. It should be expected. Let's go out and have a great week of worship. You guys are dismissed.